and welcome to another episode of the Jump Music Initiative podcast. Today we have with us a special guest, Matt Berry, and my co-host, Lisa Jacobs. Welcome, Matt. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> so Hi. awesome Yay. of you to take time <laughs> to meet with us today. So the first thing I want to ask you is just if you could give us a little uh, overview on what you do. Um, you are the music director at Calgary Zone X92.9, but how did you get into that role and what is it that you do now? Um, so I got into uh, radio, like, I guess I don't know if you want like the full backstory. Um, I'll try to make it brief. I got into radio um, initially because I wanted to do film. So I wanted to, like, at least like I knew I wanted to, to start doing that. I wanted to do like, something in media. And uh, so I was working a job, like I was bending rebar, didn't really like it. We spent a lot of time, like, because we were doing like 12, 14 hour days in a warehouse, like listening to radio. And like, I was listening to it like as a kid, but this was like the most I've been exposed to it in years. And this, um, this ad came on for this radio school. And it was like, do you want to do a, like, a job that's fun and exciting? And I was like, yeah. I was like, do you want like something new every day? I'm like, yeah. It's like, do you like music? Blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. Like, it totally like, <laughs> it like had everything I wanted to do. Cause it was like three in the morning. I'm sitting there bending steel. So uh, anyway, so I went to the school uh it's it's shut down now it was a fraud it was a fraudulent school um called the canadian school of modern broadcasting um and it was like a six-month course though so that's why i took it because it was like an accelerated program um whereas like nate and sade are both two years and mru's four i was like oh i don't want to do any of that it's like six months sounds right up my alley for extra schooling and the plan was actually to like do radio kind of like get into like that realm and then kind of move into like, you know, maybe like, it's like, I don't know, it's like music videos or something. I don't know. It just seemed more exciting than what I was doing. So yeah. So my, I started as an intern um, as like anyone, like, I guess if they're looking to get into radio, um, typically like this is kind of, this is a typical path um, to start is like typically you go to school um, and then you, you'll usually do some sort of internship to get experience. So my internship was at a station. Um, it's called big Earl um which is now i think it's called the breeze in edmonton and it was just like yeah i just worked uh, i cleaned up dog crap is what my job was um and then i went to uh then i got a job at the bounce uh which is now kiss fm in edmonton i'm, I'm from edmonton this is why um and then i just started doing board hopping there so the board hopping is you know where you just like when someone's live like on location somewhere um, I was at the studio working the board. So I would just, you know, make sure their mics are on and off. And that was, that was it. Just made sure everything timed out right. And then I kept asking my boss, I was like, is there a way that like I can get on air? Cause that's what I wanted to do. Um, Cause I, once I started like working in radio, I just, I really fell in love with it. Like once I started working that and learning everything like in school with it. Um, so I wanted to make on air my focus. So yeah, so I just asked and kept like kind of pestering. And then he eventually let me on like doing overnight shifts. So I'd be on from like um, midnight till 5 a.m. on weeknights. And then he started letting me do more. And it wasn't, it wasn't paid. It was like, I was just willing to do it. So he put me on, yeah, midnight to 5 a.m. And then the weekends, I would do a board hopping shift on Fridays. That was, um, it was 11 till 2 a.m. And then I'd be on the air from 2 a.m. till 5. And then I'd sleep at the station until 8 and then run the, like, do the, the board hopping from, like, 9 till 2. And then if I was lucky, I got to go home and sleep. Or I was also working at, uh, I ended up, at some point in, in this, I quit my job bending rebar. And I just worked at Starbucks. That was like one that was like right up the road from the station. So anyway, so if I was lucky, I got to go home and sleep or to go work at Starbucks for a few hours. Then I'd go back to the station and do a 9 p.m. till 1 a.m. hopping shift. Then I would um, either nap if I could, depending on the day, or, or uh, do like more show prep. And then I'd be on the air from 3 a.m. till 7 a.m. Um, from like Saturday to Sunday. And then whatever, then I'd kind of decide what to do during the week. And then in that time, like that's what I was doing. I was just building a demo. Like I was doing shows, building a demo and um, just sending it out to a bunch of stations. And one of the stations that I've always, that I love, like from like the first time I heard it was X-99 in Calgary. 
And it was just like, you know, just such a cool, cool vibe of the station and everyone like just listening, like everyone seems so, so awesome. And just had a totally different vibe than most other stations in the country. And so my goal, like, I was like, oh, like, I'd love to work at that station one day. And I just like kind of set in some stuff, never heard back ever. And then a position opened up to do um, like weekends and overnights. And it was like, I was perfectly qualified for it because I had been doing on air now at the at the balance for for around a year and this was also like a you know an introductory kind of job and yeah so then i ended up i came down to an interview and i got it and and yeah that's i kind of kept moving my way up so when i started there um i was just doing just doing on air but then uh there was a guy who was working in the music department and he quit and so then I wanted to learn. So I wanted to get into that position. So it started off just like, you know, doing music logs and just kind of, you know, reconciling where it's like, we just kind of go through the, the shows and like make sure everything played where it was supposed to. Um, super thrilling. I know. Uh, and, and that's kind of like where that started. And then I just, I started learning scheduling and started going into like the music meetings and things like that. And yeah. And then I, that became a part of my role. So I became assistant music director, um, within that role and then yeah in that time like i'd i'd send out for like music director roles and either i got an interview and like other someone else would get it or whatever and yeah and then so i've worked at x now for 12 years and almost yeah I guess almost four years ago i got the music director job full time when our old music director lynch had left um yeah so i took that over and now I realize that I've just like been talking for too long. <laughs> uh, so my, so now that I have that role, um, what your kind of day to day is, is like, is finding, it's finding new music and building your day out. Right. So it's building the, everything you hear on, on the station is, is what, like what we've programmed. So my job is like to kind of go through like my day to day work is typically going through, um, you know, like a day or two ahead of the music and, you know, just sort of like scheduling out what's, you know, like the vibe of the hour is, what sounds good, like back to back and sort of creating like these good music flows um, in between like the talk of, of all the, of all the on-air talents and, you know, and, and kind of like work just making sure that like, you know, like updating the blog, updating like back end things. Um, and then every week we do our music meeting, which is where we kind of go through like a bunch of the new music that has come out during the week. And my job is to go through all the music that I've been sent that week and things that, um, you know, seem either that they're like taking off charts wise in like the U S or in Canada, or just like, tracks that people are like hyped about and so we deal a lot with like um obviously your major music labels and a lot of indie labels as well for sending in music so my job is to take whatever i've heard that week and decide what goes into the meeting because i can't bring everything that i had it's like my job essentially is to filter out um what what i think works for going on air and then bringing that into the meeting and then we decide from there um, what gets added into like a feature or gets added onto the air. Um, so that's like my music director role. And then on, on the flip side, I also do um, exposure. So this is where we do like our, it's a whole hour that's dedicated to independent bands um, throughout Calgary. Um, we try to do like a Calgary, Alberta um, focus um, just because we're in Calgary and Red Deer but um, we play indie music from anywhere across Canada um, so I've had bands from like Northwest Territories like PEI and like you know Victoria Island just everywhere and try to embrace stuff that's you know like unique a little um, you know like kind of under like the alt umbrella where it's like stuff can be a little more folk um, some some stuff's like a little more pop it's an hour on a Sunday night at nine so it's like it has a little more freedom to to be out of the realm of what we normally play. Uh, so yeah, so that's a lot of fun. And so that's a really, really cool hour to like, um, to curate and and sort of design each week and trying to really give a focus on like new stuff that's been coming out as well. Um, and just trying to show some bands some love, like particularly when we could tour, trying to show like showcase like when shows were going on. Um, now it's like a little more on like live streams, but it's, uh, it's it's a little bit different in that realm 
but yeah, it's just trying to try to showcase all of that. And then I also host the countdown show on the weekends too. So you okay. can have- Woo! <laughs> you don't even need us to ask you a question. You like covered it all. That's amazing. So I realized after I was like, do you need a life story? Probably not. <laughs> But it wasn't, then it was almost over, so it didn't matter. But yeah, so that's, uh, <laughs> that's my life up until now. <laughs> and we're done here, folks. Um, <laughs> Matt, thank you. That was so thorough. That was, that was incredible. So I just want to clarify, um, you were describing your role as a music director and then also as an on-air host. You do yeah. both of those, right? And so you have two on-air hosting shows? Yeah, uh, three, I guess, technically, including the Alt 20, and then Exposure, and then I'm on evenings. Um, I'm on evenings from Monday to Wednesday, um, so seven to seven to midnight. Okay. And then is the music director and program director, are those the same jobs? No, they're, they're separate. So the program director is more in charge of, so ultimately everything we decide to go on air, um, our like program director, Christian Hall, he makes the final call on on that and like on our talent that gets hired and all that kind of stuff in our music meeting we do have um we do have a group so it's um you know it's it's my it's myself um christian um angela valiant who's our assistant music director and then we have the music director and the assistant music director in uh in red deer as well um so we all discuss it and then um and then we also have our our assistant program director here in calgary so we have like a broad group of people that sort of like listen to everything that I then send them. And then we sort of whittle it down to like what we liked best and I kind of discuss what's um, what goes on the air. And so the program director, his job is ultimately, um, you know, like he's, he's in charge of like the overall sound of the station in a, in a more broad sense. Like he's in charge of, you know, like our, our air talents, um, you know, like how like the commercials go, how, um you know dealing with like you know the sales reps and things like that um dealing with promotions and all that kind of stuff so it's more of a more of a broader sense of of the entire station and then like my job's more focused on it's like strictly like your day-to-day um music okay. and i did also point out sorry that uh it's like if there's radio people that are listening uh my path i got very lucky where i didn't have to i did like brutal overnight shifts and stuff at the at the bounce but uh i do want to say it is more common to actually leave your bigger markets and have to go somewhere that's smaller um it's not always typical but it is that's that's probably my story of doing that is probably is less typical than what most of the other radio people have to do a lot of them typically have to go to like small alberta town um, or wherever, like anywhere in Canada, and and do these other gigs in order to get that. I got I got very lucky very early on to get my job at X. But so I want people to think that's like it's like it can be done. It's just it's less it's less uh, it's less common. But uh, but it can be like Angela Valiant. She is a very similar thing. She got her job at Virgin Radio um, and is now at X. Okay. Well, you had a very like special kind of hustle that I'm sure not everyone is equipped. I guess so. Yeah, let's say it was free for too long. (laughs) (laughs) So I think most musicians, um, young and old, um, are always wondering, like, how do people, how do artists get their music on radio? And so if you can break it down in kind of like two ways, like how does an indie artist get their stuff on radio and how do people how do artists that are really well known and have already had a lot of success and airplay how do they continue to do that okay so yeah let's start in the indie realm so when you're smaller with your smaller bands um you know say for like a for a show like exposure um as long as like the bands fit under you know like a you know like the alternative realm you know it's like it's like we're not playing, you know, like full on pop acts or like full on like hard metal acts or anything like that. But it plays within like the the alternative realms. Like exposure is a great way to sort of get that play. Um, you know, like like I get bands emailing me. Um, it's just mad at x929.ca. Um, if you want to send in send in some tracks. Um, sometimes it does take me a while to get back to you because we do get a lot. Um, which like, if you don't hear back from me, uh, email me again or like hit me up somewhere else. Um, it's never personal, but 
so what you can do is always like send out to some of those shows that that have more uh indie focus um you know like uh like the zone in in victoria has that um i believe live in ottawa does that as well and so that's your way to get onto your more independent shows and then you also have like cgsw cgsr on like your campus radio stations and things like that and they're obviously super embracing of of uh your indie artists so in order for the indie canadian artists to like get on the air a lot of them it's like you have to go through not like it depends on the song right like the song has to really fit like a you know, like a sound of what, what goes on to, to major radio, right? Because ultimately it's like, it is still a commercial space, right? It's, it's still something that like, you're still, we're still looking at a, at a broad appeal, even though, you know, alt is still your more niche realm of that. We're still throwing our net out to try and capture as much of the like regular Calgary audience as we can. And that's why it's always tougher to get some of the indie bands on there. And it's, it's for a couple of reasons, like the songs just production wise don't sound the same. So then if you play something back to back, it's like, you can, it's interesting. Cause you can like, you almost don't hear it. Like when you're just like, li- like when you're just like listening, but then it's like, if you play something back to back, like we'll play it in the meeting sometimes. Like I'll be like, oh, here's this band or whatever that has this track. And it's like, okay, like hear it. And then you'll play something else. It's like, oh, like that was, oh, that wasn't, uh, that was a little, little rougher around the edges. So having that kind of stuff, right? Like having production value and everything into that is huge. Um, so to get into that, like the full on, like major radio play is still very slim. Um, that's for a lot of, that's for a lot of, you know, your indie artists. And that's only because there's so many other bands putting stuff out. So I think if a band is looking to um, really make like a play at, you know, at radio, so you need to be honest with yourself on what, um, what the sound is that you're doing what type of audience you're aiming for and if that song is radio ready because there are a lot of songs out there where it's like well that's that's like great song but it's also it's like but if your song's five minutes long that's still very rare to get onto um radio and it's almost those things where it's like well, listen to that song and it's like well how can i make this into a cool you know whatever three three and a half minute nugget of music that's that sounds really cool um so I think that that's a big part of it is being um, being honest with what what it is that you're working on and putting out that feedback to other people as well. Um, like putting out to not even just like friends and like oh yeah this is awesome like, this is great I mean this is this is better than anything else on the radio because um, that's something we get sometimes right where we get bands we're like well this is better than this and you're like okay sure but that's the biggest song in the world right now so I don't know like. <laughs> Uh, it's like no offense but like what you're putting out with what you're putting out is like really good but it's you know when you're comparing yourself to these other artists it's more so it's like you need to compare it in a in a critical sense you know and really throw like you know like the ego at the door of what you're of what you're building and uh and then if you're in that realm and if you're really looking to to make that play a big thing is um, radio trackers so what you would do for a lot of indie bands they deal with radio trackers um you know there's there's um there's a bunch out there that's you know they their whole job is to talk to radio stations and their whole job is to build those relationships because most of your like i deal with a lot more indie bands based on me having exposure but a lot of like if if someone who's doing you know um, that I, I don't like, I don't know how they, if they actually deal with this, but I know that bands have a harder time hearing back from, if you just sent that off to, to someone being like, Hey, like, here's my, here's my band. They might not even open up that email, you know, like they, they might not even check that out and, and respond to it because there's a lot of other stuff to put out there. So the job of the radio tracker is to almost, it's once again, a filtering system, right? It's to help kind of be like, well, here's something that I have. And they go, I think we can do something with this or here's what, here's where I think we could, we could play with that. So these people are hired on as, um, you know, as, as experts, you know, this is what, this is their job is to then work all that. And that's not, that's not foolproof. 
you know, if a band, um, just because you have a radio tracker doesn't mean you're getting on the air. And this will bring, bring us into the bigger bands as well. Um, but a radio tracker definitely helps. It's the same way as like I was talking with school where it's like with radio school helps you get into radio because you're showing that you had that dedication to like kind of like you're, you're putting that, that uh, time and effort into going to school to be doing that. And with the radio trackers, um, it's, it's not like the only way you can get on, but it definitely is an easier way to get through all that. And it's someone else who's vouching for you. And with that, um, it's like you should also find a radio tracker that has, you know, that has um, reputable bands that they've also put out there, and and show and are showing you like the success and showing you like the the hustle of what they're what they're doing to put it out there, and have that realistic expectation that it may not. This doesn't necessarily mean it's a it's a radio hit, you know, like it's you know like, but their job could also be like. Um, it's like, let's get you onto those indie shows. Like their job can also be to send out to all of the campus radio stations and to send out to all of the, you know, indie shows and CBC and Sirius XM or like the verge or anything like that. So, so that's kind of their jobs to have someone do that for you. Not that you can't do it, but it's just a little bit easier. Um, but it does, it does cost money, which is why you need like, once again, it's like, be honest with what you're creating and be like, is this, is this on par with what what else is uh, out there in the in the radio realm or are you doing something that's so different like but at the same time i was gonna say like so different so unique but also still it's like remember like it's the mainstream like you're looking to cast that net to capture as wide of people as possible right and there's some bands that like really break through with that um that have like a super weird sound but even that sometimes not fully embraced right away like the last band i can think of that was like ended up blowing up um was like alt j i remember when we first listened to alt j i was like what the hell like what is this what are you guys doing and i was like then the songs start taking off like i don't give it a shot and then like alt j just like blows up right and like and a totally weird sound then like when they first came out and now there's a lot more bands in that realm but uh but yeah so just it's kind of having that uh that hard conversation with yourself and sending that stuff out there to people that that you respect or sending it out to just other people in the industry um and looking at that um, so any questions before we move on to mainstream day? <laughs> no, man, Thanks this is that. incredible. Okay, yeah. Mainstream artists, how do they do this? The mainstream artists, um, so they found a way like, so for whatever reason, like either they've had singles that just like they hit, you know, like they just, they might've been like indie bands that whatever, like they wrote some sort of song and they had that, I don't know just that, that special sauce or some sort of X factor in these songs that allow them to, you know, sort of break through everything else and, and get on the air. So we have a couple realms of that. There's like the bands who have, um, you know, either like Canada wise and like, and, and stateside and everything too, that have, you know, cause it, at some point, every one of these bands that are now major bands were indie, you know, like, a, like all of them all started off, as you know for lack of a better term just like just like nobody's it's like why do i like why do i care about the killers you know um outside of like maybe foo fighters but even then it was like the drummer from nirvana's got a band <laughs> like, in other senses like if you put that into any other realm it'd be like who cares you know like, even if it was nirvana you're like okay great but the band you know came with, came with the the hits like they had it right um they have that like whatever it is like people just keep gravitating towards you know a band like the Foo Fighters so let's say once you've gotten past the sort of like initial stage of like getting your your track on the air all those bands still go through at least with X um, all those bands still go through the same process so they still go through like we get sense you know X amount of bands are going on the air the music directors are out in the world um sort of whittle down like that week's worth of music that we heard into you know i like i try not to overwhelm everyone in the meeting because if you listen to so much all of it just gets buried at a certain point so i try to keep it between like no more than eight songs to listen to in that session because it's it's a lot like a lot adds up and and really like we we only have a couple of spaces each week maybe to to fill in which uh which can, you know, kind of brings us to a separate point. But for a lot of these bands, then they go through that that same realm, right? Where they go, we listen to it, we hear what what's going to sound good on the air, what we think works. And 
Um, and then if it makes it to that point, it goes to like a feature typically. Um, and we listen to that and be like, well, how does it sound ultimately now on the air? How does that sound in the in the tapestry of the station? And do we do we like how that sounds? And do we want to continue playing it? Do we want to now give it 20 something spins a week up to, you know, do we hear it as something that can be spun 50 times a week? And so they kind of get into that realm with like, they now have, like they have a label that's pushing it. You know, they have a, and it's not even just majors. Like everyone looks at, um, this is one thing I do want to say, like everyone looks at major labels as like, like as if major labels are controlling what we're, what we're putting on. It's like the only benefit that a band has to a major label is that you have, um, you just have like a bigger, a bigger machine that's able to, that's able to hype you up. You know, your labels, your hype, you're a hype person, you know? So that's what their job is. Like they're ultimately just like, they're your radio tracker on steroids where it's like, they're able to work, work a little more things with you um, to get you out there, but ultimately to get you on the air. Like we don't, um, you know, we don't, if we think, if we're hearing something we're like that is, this is trash, this is not good. We will not play it. Like if we're like, we do not like this, it doesn't matter if it's like whatever the band is, you know, and be like, it's, it's not very good. Um, and unless something otherwise can like sways that difference. Like if for whatever, like we've been wrong in the past, obviously like we're not, uh, we're not foolproof, but it's like our job is to decide what sounds best for X and what we believe our listeners want to hear and what our audience wants to hear, which is with any, any radio station. But um, we're pretty, yeah, like we're pretty staunch on like, if we don't, if we don't like something, um we like we're not gonna just we're not gonna necessarily play it just because just because it's whatever band um like a big one say recently is uh, billy eilish where like we started playing one of her singles and she started blowing up in the pop realm and we're like okay and not that it's bad like the music's the music's good but we were like this is not it's not the x brand anymore and people like you know the label might be like well every other radio station in the country's playing it's like great then you don't need us you know, we'll we'll give some love somewhere else to, uh, to something else that we'd rather um, that feels deserving of that spot. Not that say an artist like Billie Eilish doesn't, but it's um, it gets to a point where it's like, well, that's no longer alternative. So yeah, so those those major bands still go through um, the same the same ringer as everything else. The difference, I think, I would put it as like, and it's like I'm not getting poli- I'm not meaning to like get political, but it's like where you talk about where it's like. It's like yes, it's a straight white man. Like you have privilege, and that's that's what you've established now. You've had, you know, it's like you've established that you you created a hit or you've created a few hits. So you so you now have that that inside pass where it's like okay, you now it's a little it's a little easier to give that um, give those songs to to that group to be like, well, here's the new Foo Fighters versus here's the new band no one's ever heard of where it's like ultimately when you go to your you know you're putting on your playlist and everyone's like what you know here's the 10 songs that you should listen to and it's like well like yeah like Foo Fighters like we call it like a Mount Rushmore band right where if you look at like what alternative is nowadays or at least like there's like if you want to package X and be like here's X929 as like here's your little nugget it's like well yeah Foo Fighters will be in there over it's like well who's this like who's this artist um so that would be the the best way to describe it but ultimately it's like um we still want to give what what sounds best for for on air so just because a band has that status if the song's garbage we're not gonna we're not gonna play it or we don't like how it sounds on the air we're not gonna play it but um yeah with the just with the the label thing again is that a lot of um like just because the band has a major label doesn't mean that you're necessarily getting the, that success. It's just a little bit, it is a little bit easier only because you have more people pushing it. And then in turn, um, a lot of those major labels do have those big bands on their labels for a reason because they're big bands. So if a band has a huge hit, then you do have those, it's like, it's a cycle, right? Cause if you get the bigger hit, then you might have that major label. It's like, how would you come to us? And, and then it, and then it goes like that. Um, whereas it's like, you know, sometimes they work with like some of those up and coming bands, but once again, not, not a, not a guaranteed thing, just a little bit easier to, to get in the door. Cause it can be like, 
that's why I always talk about Foo Fighters, but I think it's a great example because everyone knows who the Foo Fighters are. But it's like, hey, while you got your ear about the Foo Fighters, here's this, uh, here's this other band out of Toronto that we want you to check out. And you're like, oh, okay, like that's that's cool. And then there's a little bit more, more of like a building and a story behind it, right? But uh, but yeah, regardless if it's a major band or or not, it still goes through the same process to get on the air at X. Long story short. <laughs> I love it. Um, just quickly, I, I want to know your thoughts on the future of radio, given the climate now with streaming being so prevalent and, and playlists and everything that's coming up now. What do you think, where is radio going? Um, so I think radio, like, I, I don't believe radio is going anywhere. I think radio still has that special um, connection. I'd say our bigger things with radio is that you'll see more radio go um go more like more digital a lot more you know like your app focus because if if it's going to get to a point where you can have you know spotify in your car um then it's like well we want the x99 app to be there as well right or whatever you know whatever your radio station is to have that app so i think there will definitely be more of a more of a push for that and digital content in general you know like at least for on-air host wise like you'll be you'll see more digital content as a way to kind of push all of that but music wise so like i don't know like my mentality is and uh has always been and and i assume will continue that way it's like a radio like a radio hit or like a radio song is still wildly different than something that might stream 80 million times because people listen in my view to streaming differently i can put on a streaming playlist at home and it's just like it's kind of on while i'm cleaning or Whereas like if I'm listening to the radio, it's like I'm having a more intimate experience. I am listening to, you know, someone who's presumably in my city that I want to talk like that. I'm, you know, maybe like not necessarily talking to, but like having a conversation with, and they're listening to the same music that I am. And, and everyone is right. Like everyone at the same time, like if you're all listening to X9 to nine, you're all hearing that like new song together. You know, you're hearing that, that new band, when we play something as a fresh cut, and it's like, this is the first time we've ever played this. This is the first time we're all hearing this together, um, which I think is, I, I think will continue to be the, the, you know, that, that sort of X factor that, you know, your Spotify or Apple musics don't have. Um, so, so I hope that that will always continue because I, I think one of the downsides right now, and you see it a lot in, um, in us radio where it's like, they take things, um, and this is where I think like, not to like toot our own horn, but I think like X really deviates from a lot of other stations. Um, just like, I don't know, like North America wise, is that like a lot of them will be like, well, this song's charting on TikTok. It has, you know, X amount of listens because these people listen on TikTok and then they're streaming it. It's like, yeah, because like it has that little, like there's that little hook. It's like, great, that it had that 15 seconds that people really loved or could do a video to or a dance to. But ultimately it's like, listen to that song do you want to hear that song 20 something times or more on your radio station and in our in our minds we listen to a lot of these songs not that they're not all great but there's a lot where it's like no like it has i get it i get that little that little piece there but that is not represent representative of the rest of the x brand the rest of even in my mind alternative radio um so i'm hoping that radio itself learns that we are our own hit makers. We are, you know, we're able to to capture an audience in a completely different way. And we're able to, you know, create these bands uh, or like create like stories with these bands that, you know, that, that I don't think streaming and everything can do. Like they still do it. Like they still create other hits, but I don't think because something is big on streaming that it's necessarily big for radio and vice versa, right? Like there might be something that's like, our biggest spun song and, and, and it doesn't get any streaming numbers and that's fine. It's like, cause I'd rather them come to us and listen, than go home and listen to it on Spotify. I want them to be like, let's check out X and check out this, check out this uh, song. So I'm hoping that we get more of just like, you know, we get our own, we get our own story and our own sort of, um, you know, subset of the, of the music listening fan. You know, because we still have people who love music discovery and we want to continue that. Um, and so I hope we can continue to be a place for that as well. Because one of our, one of the things we find with radio, which kind of goes to like, 
you know, it's like you have your new music fans, but in radio, we we have new music fans, people that want new music discovery, but they're not the people who are like finding these sub genres somewhere on Spotify or Apple. And, and then we're maybe playing it like six months later. Cause we always get handed for that. People like this is an old song. It's like, yeah, but you're looking at a realm of millions of songs, like thousands of songs being released today. That's, you know, it's like, it's, it's different. It takes time for songs to build. Sometimes it takes, you know, just, it's a moment. Sometimes there's songs that like, for whatever reason, something didn't take off a year ago. And then people start listening to it again. And it just, there's something with that song and how the world's feeling, I guess. I don't know. There just helps something um, get a little more propelled. Um, and I don't know what it is, but I hope that we can continue to, to have that, like that listenership. That's always like, Oh, like, you know, like here's this cool new radio song, even if it's not like something that's right out of the box hot, you know? Oh, okay. I have never thought about the fact that when I'm listening to the radio, all these other people are also hearing the exact same music at the exact same time as me. That has got me excited. It's like little goosebumps thinking about that. Ah, oh, okay. So that's really special. Um, I'm so glad you pointed out all of those things that really separate re- radio from other from the other forms of music and oftentimes free music that we have access to. Um, Okay, so you've mentioned a few- I want to remind you, radio is free. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, when I was growing up, like radio was crucial because the only other free music you had access to is your parents or the library. And, um, you know, you can't really find new music with your parents. It's old new music to you kind of vibes. But yeah, so I mean, the radio was crucial back then. Um, Okay, so you've touched on a few times um, about the idea of the story and the artist story or when you guys are in meetings. when you're presenting music and sharing a little bit of the story. And when I've been on radio tours and been driving around with the radio guys, um, they reference that a lot, the artist story or the story behind the song. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Cause I think a lot of artists don't even and up and coming musicians don't even know that that's of interest and of interest to you guys. So can you like divulge on that a bit? Yeah. Do you mean like the individual story like of the band, like what they, what they've done sorry like yeah a little um yeah I mean like you've said like when you go to present a song to your people you tell like a little backstory or something interesting yeah. about it do, do you do was I understanding that correctly oh, yeah. no sorry um yeah I just wasn't sure like because there's every band I guess like has like the, the story behind them where it's like it's like oh here's how we started but it's always like it's always nice to have something yeah that's a little um you know like a little I don't know, unique or something a little bit different or where our bands, you know, sort of came from as like, it's the nice little, it's a nice little thing to share or like how a song, um, yeah, like got created or how a song sort of, um, you know, got into, got into the point where it, where, where it's now being heard. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think of like, like examples of it. <laughs> like, like there's, um, I'm trying to think of like a new newer artist. Um, like one we play, like so her name's Carol's daughter. And she was one of those artists that like started blowing up on TikTok for whatever reason. But her story is really interesting because she's like 18, like has this big song that like blew up. And it's a song that was like recorded on her phone. She recorded it like, as like a like um in the same way as like SoundCloud rappers. So she did it where it was like, oh well, these guys are just like recording whatever music with like garage bands putting these sounds in there, recording their vocals and putting it on. And then people are discovering it. We're finding it on SoundCloud and it blows up and it's, you know, and it, and it just kind of takes off from there. So those are always interesting, right? Where those, I don't know, these little, little kind of pieces all come together um, to, excuse me, to sort of share with the world, you know? Um, so I would like hearing, yeah, just like whatever, a, like a song is about or whatever sort of, interesting things a band has going on for them right and it does help to like like i said the yeah i guess like build a story of like you know particularly if they've been touring it's kind of tough like now but like if they were able to like tour around for a few years or worked on certain records and for whatever reason like they did something that like it's like what made this song kind of pop you know so when an indie artist say sends in something to you after they've considered the length of the song and the quality and if it's going to fit the radio style, all those things you mentioned, um, they should also maybe like consider crafting a little bit of like almost like a sales pitch story wise to include in the email. Is that helpful? Yeah. Oh, sorry, good. I didn't even no, yeah, is that helpful? That's it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's definitely helpful. I think it's it's also as you're saying that we're like crafting a story. It's like it doesn't need to be like written like a. It's like here's this tale, you know, like, where it's like it's like you're not writing a, like a short story, but it's <laughs> like interesting to be like, oh, here's where like you know a story with like a production, like where it was produced. Or, you know, who produced it or how, yeah, how like the song came about. Um, one of the things, this is always a pet peeve of mine, is where it's like you read something from a band where it's like they're trying to pitch it as their own. But then it sounds where it's like, it's like either you you wrote this, like it's like it's always there's a fine line between like hyping yourself up and being like, this is the great, like, you know, so-and-so band is the greatest band anyone's ever seen live. <laughs> and then you're like, if that's the pitch you're putting out there, if I see you playing at, you know, Broken City, you better, like, you better blow me away. Like, that better be the best, like, greatest live show that anybody's ever seen. Or it's, like, sometimes written where it's, like, <laughs> I don't know, it's, like, where you're describing, you know, like, uh, you know how, like, beers nowadays all have, like, all have these, like, stories where it's, like, so, you know, they're, they're trying to be, like, way too descriptive of the beer. <laughs> It's like, well, now you're like, now you're just telling me like a tall tale. <laughs> so it's a fine line of like describing the band and like what like the story is behind the song, and describing something where it's like, oh, like oh, like you're you're like J.R. Tolkien, like you're trying to like, <laughs> create like the there's a difference between like the story of the band and then it's like, and here's like <laughs> fiction, you know? <laughs> that makes sense, like. I just see it. I see it like quite a bit. Where I get these things, where it's like, who's saying this? Like, who wrote this? You know, who's this? Why are you? Why are you pitching your band like this? And if you are going to say it, though, if you are going to be that, then, then like, you know, then then blow me away. Like, this better be. This better be the when I click play. This better give me that energy. You know. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for your time today and for sharing little tidbits with us. And um, the last thing I want to say, we usually end our podcast by asking the guests to give a piece of advice. What would what would you leave off with the next generation of young musicians? What advice would you give to them? Um, so <laughs> but just despite the fact that I work in radio, we're like discussing that the, the biggest time it, or most of the time. Um, my advice would be that like, but you know, particularly now, but it's like radio is not the like be all end all of being a musician. Like there's so many musicians that can now make a living for themselves. Um, you know, never never getting real radio play, but it's like you can tour nowadays. You can you can go on Twitch. You can go on Bandcamp. You can um, you know you have so many free places to put out your music with like Twitter, TikTok, you know, Facebook, Instagram, like. Um, so you can put out your music out there in the world and, and there will still be people that will, that will hopefully support that. Um, but my best piece of advice would be to, you know, is to just continue doing what you love. So as we talk about doing these songs that are for radio, um, whereas like if it's, if it seems burdensome or something that you are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, you know, we're used to like, What's the word? <laughs> I'm just trying to think of like what the word is when you resentful, I guess. <laughs> is the if you are doing these things and like like you're resenting it or you or you're not enjoying kind of crafting something um in a certain way, it's like then don't do it. Like because ultimately you should be doing something that you love. Because even if you let's say if you did that, you're like, oh I want to like yeah, I remember back in the day we used to call it selling out. Remember? We'd be like, oh, this band sold out because they made these huge hit songs. Um, so it's like if you feel that you're doing that with your music, that you are that you're selling out, you're changing what you're doing to fit into a certain box, ultimately you're not going to be happy with it because you can get like the most success in the world, but if you're still mu making music that that you don't want to make, that you are that you're making, you know, to to appease someone else, um, then it's just you're you're just not going to you're just not going to be happy with what you're doing. So I think it's important to like, always like make sure that you're loving making music and that you're crafting that, you know, crafting that art that you're doing. And, you know, there's, there's realms of success without that, but never lose that feeling of like why you're doing music to begin with or why do you want, if you do want to have the biggest, you know, the biggest hit in radio, it's like, well, do you want it for money? Is it, is it money? Is it fame? like, because I don't think a lot of the bands who have that, um, uh, in fact, a lot of the, I was going to say, a lot of the the hit songs out there aren't even, 
ones that people wrote that were like, this is gonna be the, this is gonna be the bit, best thing in the world. Um, there was like, you know, I mentioned the killers earlier. So I'll use that again, where it's like the killers, like that was Mr. Brightside was like a song they wrote in like their second um, like audition session together. Right. Um, or the second writing session. And it just, it was a song just like it took off. Um, and so a lot of those songs, even from bands that have been around for years, like another great example would be a Portugal, the man was one that they had been together. It was like 10 years and like eight albums and then feel it still was just like a smash. Like it was just like glo- globally, just huge. And it was just cause the guys were just like, you know, screwing around in the studio and they heard a, heard a cool little riff and they, and they put it out there, you know, and then people started to take notice and Portugal, the man, it's like, you know, that song was just huge. Portugal, the man were like, some people knew them, you know, like they, it was like a name, like if you worked in radio, that was like familiar. But if someone said to me, like, this goes in like the same vein as like your major label stuff. If someone was like, Hey, we got this huge hit from Portugal, the man, you might be like, Oh, okay. Like, Portugal the man, like not that they haven't had like success, but you know what I mean? Where it's like, it'd be in that same vein where you're like, okay, like it's in the door now. Like they have that, that privilege where it's like people know the band enough to at least get that in there. Um, so then feel it still just blows up. Right. Um, which actually, sorry, this is a total sidebar where we talked about like how like bands have that, uh, you know, or how you get into the door where it's like Portugal, the man, very interesting story. Cause they had these songs before where you play them and they're, they're okay. Nothing ever really took. And then feel it still is huge. And it was just like, Oh man. And then they came up with their follow-up single, which was like still good, but it was like, but we radio played it because you were like, well, these guys had, he just had a smash. They had the biggest song of the decade. So of course we're going to play the follow-up. How could you not? Even if like it was the world's reverse, if that song came out first, would you have played that one? Mm-hmm. Had they not had that huge hit, right? So I think there it definitely creates a, a realm of a bit of privilege with that, uh, um, with playing that next stuff. But uh, <laughs> anyways, yeah. Piece of advice is don't lose that, like that love of, making music don't lose what you what you're doing it to begin with because because then you're just gonna hate it and why do you like who wants to make music to hate it you know like then you're stuck in this then you're stuck in this realm like oh great i gotta go play another stadium show (laughs) well thank you so much matt that was Mm -hmm. awesome yeah that was incredible uh... thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.